What is your comfort food? I want you to think of that right now. What is it? Comfort food. If you're with someone, quick, quickly share what that is. Old-fashioned comfort food. Potatoes and gravy, maybe. Some people would say their comfort food oh, it might be ice cream. I'm thinking of a hamburger and macaroni hot dish that I grew up with. Tater tot hot dish works for me also. What's this got to do with church? Today, on a traditional church calendar, it's still the Easter season, but this is Christ the Good Shepherd Sunday. And for me, that's kind of a comfort food traditional image. Comfort food of the Bible. Christ the Shepherd. Comforting words and images. Traditional. Sounds kind of old-fashioned also. But I think there is more here than what we realize. Welcome to Worship with Grace Church, your church at home. I'm Pastor Roy Swenson. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Let's join in our call to worship. Shepherd us, O oh God, shepherd us with love and joy. Shepherd us, O oh God eternal. Shepherd us with your voice of life. Shepherd us with paths of praise and peace. Shepherd us in the way of Jesus Christ. Shepherd us in this time of worship. Shepherd us and find us wherever we are. together in this prayer for guidance. Help us to listen to you, holy voice. Let us hear our names spoken with love. Let us all hear your word of invitation. Let us then lift our voice to speak with faith and with hope so all may hear. Amen. Hi everybody, thanks again for joining us for Children's Time, and Anne, I wanted to start out, and I know that Theo and the kangaroos wanted me to do this, 
this by saying hello to all of our Sunday school kids at home. So I definitely, um, we miss you, all of the teachers miss you. We are excited when we'll get to see you again. So we just want to say a special hello. So hello to Tyson and Sydney, Jay and Katie, Lorelai and Nicholas, Angel, Abby, Teddy, Harper, Cameron, Easton, Bryn, Fiona, Kayleen, Annika, Athena, Elsa. And hello to Claire, Bella, Maxwell, Maddie, Ethan, Elliot, Sam, Kristen, Tegan, Meg, Charlie, Ian, Annie, Natalie, Jameson, um, Alana, and Easton. So hopefully we got everybody. If we didn't call your name, we're still missing you. Um, and we are excited that when we get back together, we're hoping we'll have some new friends that will be joining us. Um, so let's move on and finish up our Easter story. So the first day we're going to start with today is going to be purple. And remember what we've been doing is you're going to guess what's inside of the egg after I read um, the bit of the Easter story about that particular egg. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. So what do you think is in the purple egg? It's the spear. Jesus died, a man named Joseph asked if he could bury him. This was a brave and loving thing for Joseph to do. Remember that the men who killed Jesus did not believe that he was the Son of God. But Joseph did believe, and he wanted Jesus to have a proper burial. Joseph knew that this might get him in trouble with the soldiers, but he was brave and asked for permission anyway. Joseph wrapped the body of Jesus in cloth and buried him in a tomb cut out of rock like a shallow cave. Joseph then went away sad because Jesus was dead and he wondered what would happen next. So next we're gonna look at what is in this light blue egg. What do you think it is? It's the cloth. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like a dead man. What do you think is inside this pink egg? Thanks. Here it is. The stone. When two women came to the tomb of Jesus, they were surprised too. The heavy stone was rolled aside and the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. The angel told them, He has risen. Jesus had come back to life. This is the promise that Jesus made to his disciples at their special dinner just a few days before, that he would die but come back to life to show those who believed in him that they would live forever too. Someday, because he died for us, we can meet him and thank him in heaven. That's the story of Easter, and it's true. So the last egg we have is this white egg. Can you guess what's inside of this? It's empty because the tomb was empty when the women came to the tomb to see Jesus. Happy Easter! The scripture today is from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to the fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received the command from my Father. The Good Shepherd. One of the most famous, some would say popular, traditional images of Jesus. I used to have confirmation kids or the Sunday school kids go around and count how many good shepherd or sheep pictures they could find in the church building. Kind of a picture treasure hunt. In some of my older churches, you could always find a picture of Jesus holding a lamb. I don't know if we have any of those pictures or posters here at Grace. I did a quick walk around. But how about you at home? Any pictures of Jesus as a good shepherd? It is almost like a Protestant icon for some of us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come, we reach back, and find these images that spoke long ago to a people where shepherding was part of life. Shepherd us today with your kindness and care and wisdom. Amen. Let that image just settle in. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, as you heard in the scriptures, calling us by name, calling you by name. I know my own, and my own know me. My sheep hear my voice. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Perhaps you're thinking also of 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But then just when you have all of this cozy image all wrapped up and warm, did you see this other verse? Jesus also says, I have sheep of another fold, and I must bring them also. I've always loved that mysterious phrase, sheep of another fold, and I must go and bring them also. How does this come alive as God's word for today? I have sheep of another fold. What do you think it means? Do a little talk about that. Was he just talking to some people saying, I've got others that I'm going to go and be with? Was he just talking to some particular people at that time? Was he saying he has more people to reach? More than just a certain group? Who are those other sheep today? Rather than trying to just figure it all out back then, let's ask the question today. Could it be people outside of the church today? Are these sheep of another fold people that I don't know about? Are they people I don't even think about? Are they people I don't necessarily care about? Hmm. What does it mean, though, that Jesus wants to gather and care about and give himself to people outside of my in-group? my flock, my tribe, my nation, my race, my lifestyle, outside of my boundaries, outside of my ideas. Do I believe that Jesus cares about some people that I have left out? 
those sheep of another fold. There is a verse from the prophet Isaiah that says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Apparently that's what sheep do. I think it's what we all do. You could say that we all have some parts of our lives that need to be regathered. We are also the sheep that need to be found. We all still need to be included. And the nature of Jesus, the very nature of Jesus is to gather the flock. Reunite, reconnect, find. That's what we see in the whole direction of his life, his spirit of his life, gathering the lost, the left out, the pushed out, the separated. God is still gathering, forming, showing us the unity, forming community. His purpose is right there in verse 16. Why? So there will be one flock. Hang on to that point. I'm going to take you back to a story that Robert Fulgham told in his book, Uh-Oh. But Mike Iaconelli builds on it in his book called Messy Spirituality. I love the subtitle, God's Annoying Love for Imperfect People. He builds on this story. A kindergarten teacher was supposed to have her class dramatize a fairy tale. This was for a teacher's conference. The children got to pick the story. And after much discussion, the children achieved consensus on the old favorite, Cinderella. Cinderella was a good choice from the teacher's standpoint because there's a lot of room for discretionary padding of the parts. Every child could be in the play. Of course, all the little girls, and probably a boy or two, wanted to be Cinderella. Soon, everyone was assigned a part, except for Norman. Norman was a quiet young man, didn't talk much. Norman thought that talking was a waste of time, unless you had something to say. Concerned, the teacher asked, Norman, what character would you like to be? Norman didn't hesitate. I would like to be the pig, he declared. Pig? The teacher was bewildered. Sweetie, there is no pig in Cinderella. Norman smiled and said, there is now. And so it was. Norman designed his own costume. Pink, long underwear, a paper cup for a nose, a pipe cleaner tail. Norman the pig followed Cinderella everywhere she went and she became a mirror of Cinderella's action on stage. If Cinderella was happy, the pig was happy. If Cinderella was sad, the pig was sad. One look at Norman and you knew the emotion of the moment. At the end of the play, when the handsome prince placed the glass slipper on Cinderella's foot, Norman the pig went wild with joy, dancing on his hind legs and breaking his silence by barking. In rehearsal, the teacher tried to exclaim that even if there was a pig in Cinderella, pigs don't bark. But as she expected, Norman explained that this pig barked. And the barking, she had to admit, was very well done. The presentation was a smash hit. And guess who received the standing ovation? Of course, Norman the Barking Pig, who was, after all, the real Cinderella of the story. Now, Mike Iaconelli, in his book, goes on to build from Fulgham's story. He says, what I love about the story is Norman's stubbornness impervious to intimidation, resisting the limits of the script. Norman refused to believe that he had no place. Rather than the script limiting Norman, Norman found a way to enhance the script, to fill it full of life and laughter 
and surprise. Norman was so like Jesus. The religious leaders of the day had written the script for the Messiah. And when Jesus announced that he was the Messiah, the religious leaders of that day screamed at him, there is no Messiah like that. There is no Jesus in this Messiah script. Messiahs do not hang out with losers. Our Messiah does not break all the rules. Our Messiah does not question our leadership or threaten our religion or act so irresponsibly. Our Messiah does not disregard his reputation. Our Messiah does not hang out with those tax collectors and sinners and women and children and foreigners, especially like those Romans. Our Messiah does not befriend riffraff or frequent the haunts of questionable people. And as Iaconelli says, what did Jesus say to all of that? This Messiah does. Didn't he also say, I came to seek and to save the lost, as in the lost sheep? Do you see why Christianity is called good news? We are here to see and to be good news. That's evangelism. That's ministry. When I see the words of Jesus going to find the other sheep, those sheep of another fold, we have to remember that we are a radical equal opportunity faith. Again, as Iaconelli puts it, we are an equal opportunity faith in spite of all the playwrights in the church who are ready to say, there is no place for you in our Christianity. If you, for example, wear an earring, or wear your cap a certain way, or have a tattoo or drink wine, or have too many questions, if you look weird or smoke or haven't been baptized a certain way, if you don't like our old gospel music, or if you're in this or that ethnic group, or if you have body piercing, or if you had an abortion, or if you're gay or lesbian or gender queer, or conservative or liberal, but, well, Jesus is the one who finds a place. Even when others might think there is no place for Jesus finds a place. I would say, makes a place. No, already has a place for those who had no place. Jesus, the way I see these words about the good shepherd, remember, is the one who finds the lost sheep, leaves the 99 even, and finds the missing one. In Luke's gospel version of that parable of the lost sheep, Luke hears Jesus saying that the shepherd looks until he finds that lost sheep, until it's found. In other words, Jesus will not give up, or, or as we heard in that other lesson, not like the hired hand who runs away. Jesus keeps at it, will not give up keeps at it until it's restored, reunited, included. And here in John's Gospel, Jesus is the one who does whatever it takes, not like the hired hand who quits under pressure. Jesus is the, is the one who will lay down his life. The one who goes to other sheep. I must, I must bring them also. For me, that's just a word of, of love and passion. I must bring them also. I wonder if we have that sense of care and compassion and urgency and commitment that means you cannot just leave it alone and left behind. Again, back to Mike Iaconelli's words. Jesus believed that messiahs find places for those who have no place. And as a result, he invited every Norman, every Norman that he could find from sleazy businessmen, terrorists, dock workers, bully tax collectors, psychotics, hopelessly deranged outcasts, as well as the successful, the rich, the overprivileged elite of society. 
the Christianity of Jesus, the values of Jesus, the faithful spiritual life of Jesus is that he became the placemaker for those who had no place. Outreach, mission, justice, church is what this is about. We call it the love of God. Call it a good shepherd spirit. One of our United Methodist bishops, Bishop King, said a few years ago, and I quote, once we are in, it is our job to invite others. Bishop King said, if we are indeed the body of Christ today, then we need to embody his work, his spirit. So this verse also means that we, you and I, in the name of Christ, we also have sheep of another fold. We have sheep of another fold also. King, Bishop King put it this way, he said, who are others that we invite in? All means all, Bishop King said. He said, I see people welcoming those who are just like them, but Jesus challenges us to welcome those we do not know yet and those who may be quite different from ourselves. And I hope that has been something that you are hearing from me and from this whole ministry of Grace Church. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is already out there ahead of us, looking and finding and welcoming others. But as a church, why do we keep stumbling over this? Why can't the church get this? Why do we keep this to ourselves? Are we trying to keep Jesus just to ourselves? Maybe trying to keep him like, like us? Jesus won't have it that way. I have sheep of another fold, and I'm hearing also a word that says, and it's not just you. It's not just you. Not just the fold of the United Methodist Church, not just the fold of American middle class Christianity, not just people who fit in and look like us and agree with us on a lot of complicated issues. Jesus has sheep of another fold out there. Again, that language, he claims, I have sheep. I have sheep. Already being claimed, accepted, loved, welcomed. They might be out wandering in some messy edges of life. They might be in parts of life that you and I don't typically experience. Or maybe we do. And then Jesus says, I will go there. And Jesus, in other verses, says, follow me. I think sheep are meant to follow a shepherd. Now, did you notice that the gospel lesson this morning also says they will hear my voice? How do people hear this voice of Jesus Christ? What is the voice? What does it sound like? Who is giving voice to the voice? Do we have a voice that the sheep of another fold, perhaps, will recognize and hear? Mike Iaconelli, in another part of that same book, quotes something from Robert Benson. It's a conversation with a little girl. She is five years old, and he is asking her, does God love you? And she stifled a grin. And she said, yep. And she said it with such ease and confidence and certainty. Well, how do you know God loves you? And she says, because of the way he talks to me. He just likes me. I recognize it in his voice. Hear that? I recognize it in his voice. How do you think she got that? To someone who expressed it. How about this question? When people are listening to you, do they recognize somehow the voice of God, the love of God in your voice? In the statements and pronouncements of the church, what are they hearing? Do people outside the church recognize the, the all-embracing love of God? Do they hear it in our public church voice? Do they hear it in this congregation's voice and the way we work together, the way we talk about others? What is the witness of our voice? When others listen to us, what do they hear? What are you hearing right now? Or make it personal. Are you speaking the voice of Jesus in your words? 
and the actions that speak louder than words sometimes. Are you the gospel voice? And who are you talking to? Maybe that's just as important. With that tone of voice, who are you talking to? Leonard Sweet described that voice this way. He says, our personal stories of God's work in our lives and the way that we live out our Christian life ends up creating new gospel translations. Now, you might think that people are going to hear this voice. They're going to hear the good news through the gospels in the Bible, you know, maybe through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, other Bible verses. In fact, I have a translation of the Bible actually called The Voice. But the church has 2,000 years of other voices echoing, reflecting that voice. Gospel voices of St. Francis or St. Teresa or Martin Luther or John Wesley or Thomas Merton or Henry Nouwen or Dorothy Day. People have heard the love of God. They have heard Jesus through these other voices. The gospel gets voiced through people who are not famous. The gospel according to grandma. The gospel according to, to Aunt Mary. The gospel according to maybe some Sunday school teacher or some neighbor. Or the gospel according to some college kid that was a counselor at church camp whose name I cannot remember. I heard a voice. Think of the people whose lives have touched you and guided you and supported you and loved you and, and just held on to you. And you heard Jesus through those voices as a voice of love that says, you belong. That voice is being spoken here and now. I hope you hear it in my voice. I hope you hear it in Grace United Methodist Church and then I hope that you will share it with somebody. So here's another question, who needs to hear that voice? These are, these are tough times, complicated times, and it's stretching a lot of people to the limits and there is so much it's just hard. People need to hear your voice of support, of understanding. Maybe it's a voice actually of just silence and listening. Can Jesus have your voice? This week, can Jesus talk through you? Who will you talk to? Who, what? Where, when, how can Jesus use your voice? He says, I have sheep of another fold, and I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. People will listen to that voice of love, even if we think they will not listen. Jesus says, yes, they will. Maybe it's about the tone, the tone of the spirit, the tone of of acceptance, the tone of the Good Shepherd. Somebody I know needs to hear from you. Can Jesus use your voice? You too, in the name of Jesus Christ, we all have sheep of another fold, and you must include them. Include them as the church at home. Connect with somebody who needs to hear your voice in the name of Jesus Christ. The Good Shepherd. Amen. We're going to sing another song that is also a, an Easter hymn because we are still in the season of Easter. I know in many ways we, we kind of move on, but the church wants us to linger in this message and share this joy. Christ is alive, 318 in the hymn.
come to this time of prayer, I keep hearing how folks are turning to prayer in many times in many ways in their life. And maybe as part of this worship service, you have a, a special place uh, to gather for prayer throughout the week. Maybe for this time you might light a candle or just sit comfortably in a certain way. But prayer is an invitation to reach deep inside and listen to God's love. And then to trust that love. There's a prayer song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." Sometimes trust is uh, takes some work, but uh, prayer too can be like that. Coming back again, asking God to help us to trust. As we come to this time of prayer, we share joys and concerns typically on a worship service, and we do that here. And I invite you to, again, email those prayers in, be in touch with one another, and we're going to symbolize that communal prayer time with James coming again as he does on a Sunday morning holding a microphone. So imagine, imagine those prayers being voiced at this time. Imagine us also continuing to say, God is good all the time. God is good. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So let's be in prayer during this prayer song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. continue in prayer all that has been spoken and unspoken perhaps shared with others in your home knowing that we share this across time and space in the Holy Spirit we continue to pray for oh, all the ways in which this is straining lives those uh, again seeking to to care for those struggling with this this illness those trying to find uh, research and cures and treatments all those trying to, to find ways of opening up for work, but also being safe, not rushing. We pray for our, our nation. We pray for leaders around the world. We're praying for those who we might know to be going through illnesses. We lift them in our names and our hearts. Continuing to pray for students at all ages in this different way of learning and we're just praying for families that somehow all of this too there will be some precious memories again praying for all those experiencing loss just praying god in the name of jesus who taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to this offering, I want to say thank you for your generosity and faithfulness at this time. You know it's an important time, and I don't need to remind you. So, mostly this is a way of saying thank you, and uh, again, a chance for you to, to share your faith in this financial manner. Again, thank you in this time of offering.
dedicate this offering. It too is a form of prayer. These offerings that have been sent in by the mail, offerings that you have shared as part of your faith journey, offerings that have been given online, all to, for this ministry that we share, all for this voice of hope that we share. God our shepherd, let this offering be your voice of calling and care. May these gifts speak words of welcome and hope to all. In the name of Jesus Christ, let this offering become words of love. Amen. I hope that you have heard some words of comfort, but also some words of call. A benediction is meant to be a good speaking, but often this is also a sending forth. The Good Shepherd is also working through you. We have a Good Shepherd who calls us to go out and find and include and care for others. Hear the voice. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is the voice. The love of God is the voice. And that speaking, assuring of the Holy Spirit in you is also the voice. by the mail or dropped off in some cases. Prayers are exhibited to a cut. <laughs> we'll do a redo. That's fine. You can just start up again. Yep. We dedicate these prayers. <laughs> I want the money. You want this to end up as blue as the end? dedicate prayers too. <laughs>